Good evening, everybody. We're going to get started here in another minute or two. So they're waiting for us online all over the world. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this second session in our Lenten course, Four Days That Changed the World. And I welcome you, and I welcome those who are watching at home, parishioners, as well as our distant parishioners, some from Texas, some from Canada, and some from England. It's good to have you join us tonight. Let's begin this evening in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the blessings of this day and the blessings of this Lenten season, this season that invites us to go deeper in our prayer and to be more generous in our good works and almsgiving and more dedicated in our fasting. We ask that you bless us and bless the whole church this Lent. May it be for us a season of renewal and new birth Bless those who are preparing for the Easter sacraments. Bless those who are estranged from the church and who are looking for a way in. Show them, dear Lord, your light and lead them home. And we bring our prayers together as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, just to give an overview of our program, the first night was about Holy Thursday, and what was the Last Supper. Tonight we focus on Good Friday, and we're going to use the San Damiano crucifix as a way of going deeper into the mystery of Good Friday. The next session will be on Holy Saturday and the burial of our Lord and his descent into hell. That's a phrase that's somewhat uh, disconcerting to some people and we will hopefully unpack the meaning of that statement from the creed. And then in our final session, we will talk about Easter Sunday, specifically about the empty tomb in Jerusalem and the research that was done in 2017. Now, for those of you who are watching at home, I need to tell you the bad news that the fourth session, the session on the empty tomb, is going to be primarily the watching of a videotape based upon the National Geographic issue of December 2017. It's a video called The Secrets of Christ's Tomb. It's an explorer special with the National Geographic Society. We have the copyright to respect. We can show it here in church, but we can't put it out on the web. So I encourage you to, uh, to explore the internet to see if you can get your Explorer special uh, DVD. It is accessible and you should be able to get a copy if you would so like. Please know that in session number three, I'll do some setup for the video. I'll do some preliminary explanation so the video will make more sense. But just know that session four will not be live streamed, but we will be able to watch the video here in church. And if you are local 
we do have some copies of the DVD here at church and you're welcome to make use of them if you don't wish to purchase your own copy. Um, just one thing left over from last time, and it was a very good question that was asked after the session was over. After we talk so much about Passover, the question was, well, what, what really is Passover? And we can answer that in three different ways. We can say that Passover was indeed the event that took place during the 10th plague in Egypt when the angel of death passed over the people of Israel who had marked on their doorpost uh, the, the blood of the Passover lamb. That was indeed Passover. We could also answer that question by saying Passover is the ritual meal that is eaten in Jewish homes every year on the anniversary of that event. We can say that and that is true. It's also true to say that Passover is what is celebrated on the anniversary of the liberation of Israel from slavery in Egypt and their passing over to the promised land. All of those things are contained within the meaning of Passover. In many ways, it would be as if someone from a different country were to ask you, what is, what's the 4th of July? What's the 4th of July all about? Well, you could say that it is the anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence that took place on July 4th, 1776. That would be a correct answer. You could also say that the 4th of July is a special holiday and we celebrate with our families and we watch fireworks and we, we enjoy a national holiday to commemorate the fact that what took place in 1776 was but the beginning of the history of our country. And everything that we celebrate on the 4th of July is about what unfolded from July 4th 1776, in the same way with Passover. We look back to the event of the passing over uh, by the angel of death over the homes marked with the blood of the lamb. Really, that was the beginning of the people of Israel leaving Egypt and going to the promised land. That makes sense? Good, good. Tonight, we talk about Good Friday and the San Damiano crucifix. Uh, how many of you have seen the San Damiano crucifix someplace? It's a very popular crucifix. It is cherished by the Franciscans. And uh, we're going to go into all the details of the crucifix. But just before we do that, know that the crucifix uh, of San Damiano was uh, displayed in the church of San Damiano during the life of St. Francis. And the church of San Damiano is in Assisi, and it's sort of, it's sort of below the, the main area of Assisi. Assisi is built on a hillside, town square, important buildings up here. San Damiano is just a little bit below and that means that it was a church frequented by poor people. Because as you can imagine, in a city built on a hill, the rich people get to live up top, don't they? And the poor people live downhill where things have been flowing downhill. And the church of San Damiano was in ruins. And St. Francis, as a young man, who had experienced conversion as a result of his suffering and recovering from an injury on the battlefield, he had a sense that the Lord was with him, that he was not going to continue living the life of a carefree, wealthy man for the rest of his life, but he knew he wanted to do something special, but he was searching and he was looking for all sorts of different ways to do that. He wanted to dedicate his life to the Lord. One day he was praying amidst the ruins of the church of San Damiano, which is shown in this image painted by Giotto. And you can see how half the church is in good shape, half of it is, uh, is without a roof. And the 
crucifix spoke to St. Francis of Assisi and the crucifix said, Francis, rebuild my church for it is in ruin. And Francis heard that, rebuild my church. And the first thing that he did was he gathered his friends together and they collected materials and they rebuilt the church of San Damiano, putting it back into order. They also did that with several other churches in the area, including the famous Porta Nunculo, which is at the way bottom of the hill in, in, uh, in, in Assisi, and that's where St. Francis died, and it's uh, commemorated as a very, very special and sacred church. He rebuilt these churches physically only to reflect more deeply and realize that the crucifix was telling him not just take up the life of a contractor, but truly rebuild my church. Bring extra devotion to my church. Help people to connect with the Son of God. Help people to imitate him. Help people to embrace a life of authentic discipleship. And that was the gift that St. Francis of Assisi brought to the church. By being a witness himself, by gathering close followers around him to be part of his religious order called the Order of Little Brothers, OFM, Order of Friars Minor, Little Brothers, uh, Little Brothers of the Lord, and the Second Order of Franciscans, the Poor Clares, established by St. Clare to pray for the work of the uh, of the little brothers, the, the order of Friars Minor, and by inspiring many, many people throughout Europe and beyond to live a life more reflective of their Savior, living a life embracing simplicity as a way of life, living a life focused upon li the living out of the gospel, the doing of good works to those most in need, St. Francis truly helped to rebuild the church in a very difficult time and at a time when the things would, would really need the influence of that religious order. The San Damiano crucifix and, and really the, the life of St. Francis is important here in our city at Marian University through the San Damiano Scholars Program. A number of years ago, Marian University recognized that the Lord was bringing to their campus many young men and women who wanted to spend the rest of their lives serving the Lord, uh, being active in the church, especially in roles of, uh, say, a, a director of religious education or a director of faith formation, youth ministry, uh, teaching in a Catholic school. And Marion set out to form those young people during those college years for those tasks and to help pay for their education so they wouldn't be saddled with a lot of student debt at the end of it and they would be able to take roles of responsibility and serve the church. So San Damiano is an important, uh, important uh, uh, program here in our own city at Marion University. To this, uh, to today, you can see the actual cross of San Damiano when you visit Assisi. It's no longer in its original place. It has been placed in the church of St. Clair, where you may go and you may sit in a chapel and gaze upon the crucifix, just as St. Francis did. Perhaps the crucifix will speak to you. In fact, I can guarantee you that if you study the crucifix long enough, if you put yourself in front of the crucifix, the crucifix will speak to you in a way, not, not perhaps the way it spoke to St. Francis, but you'll gain a greater insight into our Lord's crucifixion, our Lord's resurrection as well. And tonight what we wanna do is to look carefully at the crucifix to study the various aspects of the crucifix. And my hope is that 
this will become uh, something that you do every time you come into a church, that you'll gaze upon the crucifix and you will ask the question, what do you have to say to me today, Lord? What do you have to say to me? Now, the crucifix of San Damiano is, was uh, written in 1100. I use the term written because that's how we express the creation of an icon. And this, is, this work of art is done in the style of an icon. And the iconographer wrote this, this icon in an atmosphere of prayer according to some very traditional ways in order to communicate a great deal to people who were mostly illiterate. In many ways, the crucifix is a homily, not in words, but in images. And we're gonna study those images. The various aspects of the crucifix teach us the various parts of what happened on that Friday that we call good. Notice that the crucifix, the image of course, is dominated by the body of our Lord, who is depicted as being serene and peaceful, not necessarily suffering. This was very common in artwork in the Middle Ages, that the crucified Lord was not shown as being a suffering Lord. Ironically, it was St. Francis who encouraged people to pay attention to the sufferings of the Lord. One of the devotions that St. Francis brought to the church, in fact, was the Stations of the Cross, the meditation upon the 14 moments in the Passion of our Lord, the 14 uh, stages along the way. And the reason the reason St. Francis and the Franciscans were responsible for that devotion is St. Francis actually went to the Holy Land during the time of the Crusades. And he wanted to meet with the Sultan to prevail upon the Sultan for peace and to allow the holy places to truly be holy places. St. Francis risked his life in doing this. He was granted an audience with the Sultan who listened with great attentiveness not only to what St. Francis said, but how he said it. And the Sultan is quoted as saying, if every Christian was like this Christian, I would be a Christian. As a gift, the Sultan gave to the Franciscans the custody of the holy places, that they could be the caretakers of the holy places for the sake of pilgrims who would come that way. And today when you visit the Holy Land, you see the presence of the Franciscans who maintain a presence at the holy places, making it possible for priests like me to celebrate mass. I don't have to bring vestments. I don't have to bring hosts or wine or books. They take care of everything. They are extremely hospitable. They make sure that these holy places are not, are not museums, but rather places of pilgrimage. A special devotion is along the Via Dolorosa, which is the road that leads from the palace of Pontius Pilate to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, where Jesus was crucified and where he was buried and where he rose from the dead. And along the way are 14 markers and you can actually walk the Via Dolorosa, walking along the sorrowful way, stopping at each one to pray, just as we do in our church when we pray the stations. In fact, in order for a church to put up the stations of the cross, the superior of the Franciscan must give, Franciscans worldwide must give his permission. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a Franciscan devotion that by indult, may take place in other churches, but only with permission. 
my point is, is that St. Francis marked a, tra a transition between how we view in artwork the crucified Lord from being very peaceful to actually showing the sufferings. We notice that in the, on the crucifix of San Damiano, we notice the eyes of Christ. Notice how, how large they are. Nobody really has eyes that large. The artist is teaching us something. The artist is showing that he is the one who sees. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. It's from John chapter 6, verse 46. Notice that the Lord's eyes are looking up to heaven. He's the high priest, the one who sacrificed himself for all the people. He is an agent between heaven and earth. He is a mediator, the mediator between heaven and earth. The eyes of Christ who sees us and in seeing us loves us. And in seeing us, he thinks about us. In fact, we are, were taught from or the earliest age that the Lord was thinking about each and every one of us as he hung upon the cross. He was thinking about you and you and you and me and all of our sins. And he died knowing what we would do, but, knowing, but dying to save us from our sins the eyes of Christ. We'll look right above the head of Christ and you can see the top of the head of the Lord to see the inscription uh, above the crucified Lord and not in our church, ah, I'll be darned. I thought I'd use that as an example, but oftentimes we see I-N-R-I, which is an abbreviation that stands for the the Latin phrase, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So IHS is an abbreviation for Jesus. If you look at, there's a squiggly line over the H, and that means that it's, it's, been, uh, it's been elided. It, it means that it's been uh, contracted. Jesus, and you can make out N-A-Z-A-R-E, Jesus of Nazareth, and the next line, Rex, King, Eudeorum, king of the Jews. This is the inscription that Pontius Pilate had placed above the head of Christ as he hung upon the cross. And we're told that it was written not only in Latin, but also in Hebrew and in Greek. If you wish to see the inscription known as the titulus, the title, it is to be found in Rome in the Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, along with other relics of the crucifixion. And many scholars have been taking a look at the title and are becoming more and more convinced that this really is what hung up above the Lord on, on his, at his crucifixion. It's an amazing thing. It's, a su it's subject for another another class, or at least a part of another class. But it told the world that he was the king of the Jews. The Jews said, you should have written, this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. Christ's kingship is proclaimed by a pagan, Pontius Pilate, the king of heaven and earth, wearing a crown not of gold, but a crown of thorns. The one who shows himself that the first in this world are the ones who serve the rest. Greater love hath no one than to lay down his life for his friend, says the Lord. A lesson that he teaches not only in word, but in example. Becoming great by serving the rest, by serving you and me. We continue making our way up. You see the feet up above the title, and we'll see these in the next 
uh, we'll see the see what's above it's the image of the ascension of Christ our Lord in his in his glory ascending into heaven to be welcomed by the angels and above Jesus is the hand of God the Father and the stylistic way in which he holds his fingers is an image of the Holy Spirit. So we have at the, at the top of the crucifix, the very top, an image of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In a way, the artist is showing us that the crucifix of San Damiano, that when our eyes go up to the very top, we see not only where our Lord went after his death and resurrection, we see where we are headed if we follow him. That he goes to prepare a place for us. He goes to make ready our place in heaven and that one day we pray we will be joined with him. Notice that around this image and around the whole crucifix are the curly Q lines. These are meant to be representation of vines. Remember when Jesus taught about the vines and the branches. You are the vine, I am the... I am the vine, you are the branches. And as long as we stay connected to the Lord, we have life. You've had the experience in your garden of dealing with a long vine, maybe one of those wild grape vines. And uh, it, 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 once you cut it, it dies. Once you cut it, it dies. We pray as we gaze upon the crucifix that we will always stay connected to Christ crucified, that we will always stay connected to him like the vine and the branches, and that through him we will bear, bear fruit, fruit in this life and fruit unto eternal life. That is our prayer. And so just to kind of get us back to where we started with St. Francis gazing upon the crucifix and the crucifix speaking to him in an extraordinary way, Francis rebuild my church, we cannot expect and we should not expect a crucifix to speak to us in an extraordinary way. If it happens, praise God. If it happens, that's a wonderful thing. But in the ordinary way, gazing upon the crucifix, gazing upon this image of the Lord's tremendous love, Remembering that as we look at him crucified, that we're looking at an image of, of, of how he was once thinking of us, praying that they might all be one as you, Father, and I are one. And we pray that we will always stay connected to him as the vine and the branches. We go back down in the image to the cross beam. There's a lot going on in the cross beam. One of the features that's very interesting is the, is the black space behind his arms, the space that extends from one end to the other. Do you see what I'm referring to? this space all the way across, the, the black that is behind him, which is an image of, of, of the tomb, an image of the tomb. The way the tombs were in the time of our Lord, the tombs uh, would have opened with a, a large stone and then inside there would be shelves and the corpse would be placed on a shelf wrapped in a certain way. We're told that the women went to the tomb carrying about a hundred pounds of spices. They would have wrapped the, the corpse in spices and linen. And then the corpse would have decayed over the course of some time. And at an appropriate time, the remains, the bones would be 
uh, would be compacted uh, carefully and placed in an ossuary. Uh, this is, in fact, the way in which uh, burials uh, have taken place in, in the city of New Orleans since, since the very beginning. If you've been to New Orleans, you know that's a city that's below sea level. You can't bury someone in the ground. And so they have, uh, have cemeteries that look like little cities, a necropolis, a necropolis. And uh, in these little houses, there would be uh, places for the families to leave, leave their dead. And as hot as it gets in New Orleans, that sort of hastens what naturally takes place. And after a period of time, the body would be compressed into something smaller so that another relative could take that place. We see clear evidence of this in Jerusalem in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is built over the tomb of Christ. He would have been buried in a graveyard where there were other tombs. The scriptures say this was a virgin tomb, a tomb in which no one had ever been laid, but there were other tombs nearby some of which still exist and you can see them and the guide will shine the flashlight in and you can see the shelves just like this within a stone's throw of the place that marks the tomb of our Lord, the place that we will discuss in, uh, in both in section three, the next session, and especially in the National Geographic video. So we see Christ crucified with his tomb looming in the background. He is crucified and he will die and he will be placed in the tomb only to rise again on the third day. The tomb that claims his body will also be the tomb that sees him rise from the dead victorious, never to die again. Though Christ is depicted in a serene fashion, he's not shown to be in great agony. He is shown as being crucified. And I'm gonna zoom in on one of his hands. When we look at the hands of Christ, both of them have the same feature. We notice not just blood and not just blood dripping, but blood emerging, blood shooting out. He is truly alive. Only someone who is living can bleed in that manner. He is giving his life. He is giving his life blood, as did the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb, the people of Israel are saved by the blood of the lamb, by the lamb uh, giving its life, its life being taken from it in sacrifice, the lives of the people of Israel are sustained. And in the same way, by the sacrifice of our Lord, by him giving his blood, we have life. In fact, did our Lord not say in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, the bread of life discourse, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. His body and his blood, the body that hung upon the cross, the blood that came forth from his wounds is the very body and blood that he gives us in the Holy Eucharist, the bread of life the medicine of immortality. The angels gaze in wonderment at the gift that is being given to the whole world. They, their faces show amazement. They, the faces show sorrow. The faces show a, an atmosphere of, 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 of it, just incredible awe that the Son of God fully divine, fully human, 
would pay so great a price, the price of his own life, so that poor sinners might have eternal life. They are utterly amazed. And again, notice around the edge, the, the curly lines that represent the vine. And again, we pray that we will always stay connected to the Lord who gives his life that we might have life and have it to the full. This goes on, this is at, at the same, uh, same on, both, on both hands. The angels look with wonder, the blood gushing forth from his, from his hands. He's full of life, fully aware and fully responsible for what is happening to him. We must never make the mistake of thinking that Jesus uh, was ambushed and, uh, and, and was just the victim of a bad deal uh, and that he was going against his will. He was in full control every step along the way. This is especially true when we read the Gospel of St. John and the Passion on Good Friday. He is in charge. He knows what he is doing. He knows what awaits him and he keeps on going. He keeps on making his way to the cross, enduring every minute, knowing that what he is doing is indeed making the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, that which will set mankind free. So underneath the arms of Christ are some other figures. And we're gonna look first at these figures and then these figures. So as we look, as we're facing the, the crucifix, these are the figures just to the, just to the left of the body of Christ. As you can see, the body of Christ on the right, and then the image of the Blessed Mother and St. John. Why the Blessed Mother and St. John? The Blessed Mother followed her son every step along the way. She was the first disciple and she went with him all the way to the cross. St. John, the youngest disciple, the apostle whom Jesus loved in a very special way, accompanied the Blessed Mother. They were under the foot of, they were at the foot of the cross when Jesus gave them both instructions, direction. Woman, behold your son. And to St. John, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son and behold your mother. At one level, this is a very practical instruction. St. Joseph had died some years before. There was no one else to take care of the Blessed Mother. Our Lord had to make arrangements for her, wanted to make arrangements for her. And so he gave instructions to St. John to take care of her and for her to regard him as her son. That's at a very practical level. There's another dimension as well. St. John's gospel always has multiple dimensions. He is saying to his mother, behold my beloved disciple. Behold my beloved disciple as your son. Behold my beloved disciples as your sons and daughters. Our Lord makes his mother the mother of the church, which is why we have in the Blessed Mother a true mother according to the order of grace. And to St. John, the beloved disciple, to all beloved disciples, he says, behold your mother. He points to his mother as one deserving of our honor and respect, the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, show her devotion, 
show her respect. Give her a place of prominence in your life. And so we have at the side of our Lord, the Blessed Mother and St. John. Look what they're doing with their hands. They're pointing to the Lord, aren't they? They always point to the Lord. This is what saints do. They spend their whole lives pointing to the Lord. It's a custom in iconography that the Blessed Mother is never portrayed alone. There's never a portrait of the Blessed Mother alone. She's always holding her son. She's always holding the infant Jesus, presenting him to you, presenting him to the world. And here, he, here they are, the Blessed Mother and St. John pointing to Christ. On the opposite side, we have three figures. We have the figure of Mary Magdalene in the red, the one from whom seven demons had been cast out. It's a mistake to think of her as a prostitute that would be an injustice to Mary Magdalene. There's no evidence that she was a prostitute. Uh, it's also, it would also be mistaken to think of her as being the one uh, who was caught in adultery. Remember when Jesus sat down and drew in the sand and said, let, let the one who was without sin cast the first stone. Uh, there's no evidence of that. Rather, she was afflicted with unclean spirits he performed an exorcism upon her and she became a close follower of his. I know you might be thinking of uh, Jesus of Nazareth by Zeffirelli. Remember the movie was seven or eight parts. It was shown during Holy Week uh, back in the mid, mid to late 70s. Beautiful, beautiful film in many ways. Um, the, uh, the director cast Anne Bancroft as the, as the woman caught in adultery. Talk about typecasting. Those of a certain age will remember her as being Mrs. Robinson. We won't say too much more about that, but she was the, Anne Bancroft was the one cast as Mary Magdalene. But Mary Magdalene, a close follower of the Lord, next to her Mary uh, of Cleophas, the other Mary who is depicted at, in the scriptures. She's mentioned in the scriptures as being there at the, at the cross. And the other figure is that of, uh, that of the, uh, the centurion, the one who was responsible for a century of men, a hundred men. He was the one who gave the orders that the crucifixion take place. He was under orders from Pilate to do this. And of course, it was the centurion, the pagan, who said upon the death of our Lord, surely this man was the son of God. I want to zoom in on the centurion because behind the centurion, his family, you see the head of his son right over his shoulder and I can count three other heads, three other round heads behind. The centurion believed in the Lord and his whole family came with him. This is from the Acts of the Apostles, the, the way the jailer who freed uh, St. Peter from the cell uh, was the, uh, we were told that he and his family were baptized. The whole family would have come in to the church. The whole family would have followed the Lord. Just a little detail indicating that faith is something not just for us as individuals, but for our whole family. And that parents can do nothing greater than to introduce their children to the Lord and to the church and to give the gift that it truly matters, the gift of faith, the gift of eternal life. There's also a little detail on this side of the crucifix. It's really hard to see in the image that is in front of you on the, on the papers. Um, if you wanna see this, if you're really curious, on Wikipedia, uh, when you look up San Damiano Cross, you'll find an image, you'll find the, the image of the crucifix. 
and you can find a high resolution image and on your computer you can zoom and keep zooming in. In fact, this is what I did on my computer and I took a screen save, uh, hard to make out the rooster, the cock that crowed three times. It's an image that is meant to represent the sin of presumption presumption that as long as we know Jesus everything is going to be okay Saint Peter knew him better than most and yet three times did Saint Peter deny our Lord on the evening he was arrested the night before he died for the salvation of the world also at the bottom the, the these this would be the feet of the Blessed Mother and St. John and Mary Magdalene and Mary of Cleophas and the Centurion, you see two smaller figures associated with the crucifixion. Here you see Longinus. Notice he's carrying a spear. Longinus means spear. Longinus now honored as a saint because of what happened after the crucifixion. Longinus was the Roman soldier who pierced the side of the Lord with the lance, with the spear. And out from the side of the Lord flowed blood and water. Doctors tell us that a man who was crucified on the cross, on a cross for three hours and would have died of suffocation would have had in his chest cavity a collection, quite a bit of, 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 of fluid water and blood and so a, 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 a dead man he was already dead when this happened a, a dead man from the side of a dead man crucified would come blood and water that's a physiological fact put into the gospel by saint john to teach a theological truth from the side of christ comes the sacramental life of the church, the waters of baptism, the blood of the Holy Eucharist. From the side of the Christ, from his heart, do we receive the sacraments because the sacraments connect us with the Lord. Through the sacraments, we encounter the Lord. We get close to him. We get close to his heart. Longinus was the one who pierced the side of the Lord with the lance and afterward he converted and lived an exemplary, exemplary life and proclaimed by his life and by his words the, uh, the, the gospel of the Lord. The other figure on the other side, sort of paralleling Longinus, is a figure that whose name I was unfamiliar with. Stephaton, Stephaton, like Stephen with a PH, Stephaton, who is the one who offered the Lord wine on the, on, on the hyssop, on the long stick, kind of like a bamboo stick. He would have taken the wine and placed it to the lips of our Lord our Lord would have consumed the wine and then he said, it is finished. And as we know from the last session, the significance of the, the wine consumed by the Lord, the fourth cup, the Passover had ended and he expired and he gave up his spirit. He institutes the Holy Eucharist through the Passover meal including the, all four cups, we receive the cup of blessing, the third cup that became the Lord's body and blood. With the fourth cup, the Passover is finished. If you didn't see the session last week, it is still uh, on a file on the parish website, and you're very welcome to take a look and watch that so you can learn the significance of the fourth cup. And remember that hyssop, is specifically mentioned in Exodus chapter 12 that gives the account of the Passover. It is hyssop that is the stick that is used to dip in the blood of the lamb and mark the doorposts. 
So the significance is intentional. Let's continue to work our way through the, through the crucifix um, at the, uh, we, we, this is, oh, the, the, I wanted you to take a look at the garment that our Lord is wearing. The garment that our Lord is wearing. Um, it's not just anything, is it? It's not just, it's not just what, what he happens to be wearing. It's very distinguished. It's very proper. Um, the garment that our Lord is wearing is the garment of a priest. In the Old Testament, the priest's job was to offer sacrifice. We think of the priest in, in, in our church as the one who he teaches and he, uh, he offers the sacrifice of the mass and he also has a lot of keys on his chain and always unlocking doors and turning off lights. In, in, in the Jewish world, the, the teacher was the rabbi. The administration was taken care of by, by a group. The priest, born into a priestly family, offered sacrifice. Think of Jerusalem, think of the hot, arid climate. The priest would be down to this garment around his waist. Blood would have been all over the place as he's sacrificing lambs, as he's sacrificing uh, bullocks, all sorts of things that would have been a very bloody thing. And there were ritual washings that accompanied the sacrifices. But the, high, the priest making the sacrifice would have been in a, a, a cloth like that around his waist, stylized, made in a special way, made out of certain material in a certain way. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the priest in the order of Melchizedek who offers the sacrifice and he himself is the victim. He is both the priest and the victim, the lamb, the lamb of God, and the altar of sacrifice, all contained within his very person. We get to the bottom of the crucifix. The figures at the very bottom, some of which probably have been worn away through time, I'm sure that the San Damiano crucifix would have been venerated with kisses and with touches, uh, much to the dismay of those who were curators. Uh, they, they would have noticed things disintegrating a little bit. The patron saints of Assisi, uh, St. Damien, St. Rufino, and others. There's always an extra meaning though, isn't there? Notice that the bottom of the cross is incomplete. This band that goes all the way around on both sides, all both arms and top, and it's incomplete at the bottom. Also typical of an icon. Very few icons are placed in frames. An icon is hung on a wall or it's placed on an easel, never framed, never contained. It's open, open in the sense that it's inviting others to enter. At the foot of the cross, in humility, in prayer, on our knees, at the foot of the cross, do we gain access to all that is contained within? When do we take our place at the foot of the cross? At the holy sacrifice of the mass. At every mass, we are at the foot of the cross. We take our place as the sacrifice is offered. The same sacrifice that our Lord offered on Calvary, albeit in an unbloody manner. And this is why those who are able are, would, would kneel during the consecration. They would kneel as the body and as the bread and wine are offered. And as the words of our Lord are said, this is my body, 
this is my blood. The foot of the cross, a humble person through the foot of the cross enters into the mystery of the life and death and resurrection of Christ. One more feature. You've been looking at it all night and it's the border, the edge. What do we have here? Shells. It's a pattern of shells. And a shell is an image of baptism. The priest takes a shell or something shaped like a shell, picks up the water and pours it over the head. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The shell is an image of baptism. It's an image of our baptism. By our baptism, do we gain entrance into the life of Christ? The iconographer is showing this by putting the shell at the edge of the image in an inconspicuous way, but once you see it, you can't forget it. That it is through our baptism that we gain entrance into the mystery, which is why when we come into church, we bless ourselves with holy water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the formula of our baptism. Water touches us again, reminding us that in baptism, we die to self and we rise to Christ. We die to the old and we rise to new and everlasting life. Through our baptism, we are configured to Christ, original sin forgiven, and the road to the sacraments is wide open as is the road to everlasting life. And so as we close this evening, I just invite you to take a few moments to gaze upon the cross of St. San Damiano just as St. Francis did in that church in ruins and he heard the voice of Jesus say, Francis, rebuild my church. Let's just gaze for a moment upon the San Damiano cross and I just invite you maybe to think about what, what aspect of that cross spoke to you tonight? Which one of the little features on the cross captured your imagination, uh, gained your attention, uh, invited your devotion? I'm gonna suggest that that is how the cross of San, San Damiano spoke to you tonight. And I just invite you to look at that particular feature and just enjoy just a moment of silence. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this opportunity this evening to examine the San Damiano cross. Thank you for this opportunity this evening to go deeper into the mystery of the greatest love the world has ever known. Thank you, dear Lord, for dying upon the cross while thinking about each and every one of us. Thank you for rising from the dead, giving us the hope of everlasting life. And we invoke the intercession of the Blessed Mother who took her place at the foot of the cross where she became our mother according to the order of grace. We ask her to pray for us and to keep us in her prayers always as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Yes. Very good. I'll repeat the question just in case it didn't get through. Someone who was watching online said that this was fascinating. Is there a resource that might help to help to uh, re help us to remember? Um, there's a nice little pamphlet that was written by Father Michael Scanlon. Father Michael Scanlon, a Franciscan who for many years was the president of Franciscan University in Steubenville. And of course, as a Franciscan, this crucifix is important to him. He wrote a little pamphlet. I think you should be able to find it uh, in the usual booksellers. Uh, it's not very expensive. And he goes through many of the same things that I went through tonight. So hopefully that'll help. Father Michael Scanlon. Other comments or questions? Yes. Yeah, the one thing that really stood out to me was the hands. Mm-hmm. They're in a welcoming position. Mm-hmm. Because that can Right, right. The, 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 the realistic thing is, is that the, the nail would have gone somewhere in the, in the wrist, which would have been considered hand, you know. It would have, it would have hit a, a whole bundle of nerves and probably would have caused his, his hand to, to clench. Maybe you've seen, uh, been around people who have had nerve damage to their hand and their fingers are, are, are permanently uh, constricted. Uh, but he's, he is depicted in a welcoming manner, isn't he? As if, as if to give an embrace. And it's clear that that spoke to you tonight. Yes. Separated are, I, I'm sorry, Oh, the feet, exactly, exactly. The feet are, are separated, um, they're, not, they're not crossed. Uh, they're, they're separated again. The, 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 he's not depicted as, as being in great agony, as he would if the feet were crossed. We can only imagine what that, what that felt like for three hours. Every, every breath, he had to push his body up to get in more oxygen again causing all those nerves in the feet uh, just to just to explode uh, the it, it, it is it is meant to show just that that he's fully fully aware fully very much at peace with his calling to die for our sins interesting that you would you would notice that very good other comments or questions or ideas yes Mm -hmm. Certainly an inspired work. Certainly an inspired work. You can find other crucifixes of this age in this particular style with the wood uh, cut to, to in, in cruciform. You can find other examples. And uh, other examples can be, you know, be as inspiring. What I notice is the significance of this, that it, we know that it spoke to St. Francis. And we know that by speaking to St. Francis, great things happen in the church and continue to happen through the, through the Franciscan uh, spirit that, he, that truly that he inspires others with. Yeah. Think, of, uh, think also of the scarcity of materials, the preciousness of paints. The iconographer makes the paints according to a, a formula using sometimes very precious stones to come up with certain colors, sometimes using real gold in, in the paint for, for the highlights, using a limited amount of space communicating a great message, very similar to the writers of the gospel 
who, you know, they're, they're, they don't write, you know, a 900 page uh, story. They have only so much space to work with. And yet, ev so every word has to count. And every word does count. Every word is there for a meaning. Here, every brush stroke, every figure there for a reason. Perhaps a parable for our life too. We don't have all the time in the world. Our days are numbered. Every day counts. Every opportunity counts. We can never reclaim today. We can never reclaim today. The opportunities of today are gone. What we have tomorrow and for the next four hours today uh, is a gift to, and we should use, use it to the best of our ability. Yes. Way up top? Uh, the, the, the image up at the top uh, depicts the ascension, and these would be angels welcoming our Lord into heaven. I, to be honest, I, I did the count as well, and I couldn't figure it out at first of why, why 10, because there would have been, there would have been 11 apostles plus the Blessed Mother at the Ascension on earth. So when, when the Ascension is depicted in artwork, we always see the Blessed Mother who was with the 11 apostles, Judas uh, having taken his leave. Uh, 10 apostles would have been present the, the, on the first night of the resurrection. 12 minus Judas minus Thomas who was elsewhere. So, but these are, these are angels welcoming Jesus. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. The are uh, probably also the the family behind uh, the centurion. They would not not have the halos. Yeah, the, the artist had some, something in mind. I wonder if I can get back to that picture. The comment was that the, the ones without, oops, did I? Well, there it went. <laughs> there it went. Well, I don't think that I'm gonna be able to show this <laughs> as, I, as I had thought, hoped. Well, okay, all right, thanks. Yes? Uh, are, you, are you referring to the, to the halo? Ah, to, to, the, to the risen Lord, the, 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 the circle, uh, the circles and, and, and round objects represent eternity. Yeah, yes, he, he's, he, he's wearing a red stole. Um, red, the color of blood, the color of charity as well. It, it's interesting that in depictions of martyrs in artwork, the martyr is often shown as carrying the instrument of his execution. And so it, the, the, the idea of the cloth soaked in blood around the, around the head and shoulders of our Lord, the, uh, the, the evidence of his suffering and ev evidence of his death. Michelangelo did that on the, in the um, last judgment in the Sistine Chapel. All of the, all of the martyrs are presenting almost as, as evidence, this is, what I, this is what I did, this is, what I, 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 this is how I died on the last judgment. All right, very good. There's a lot of depth to this, just as there's a lot of depth to the account of our Lord's 
uh, passion, and this is why we meditate upon the passion through devotions like the Stations of the Cross, the reading of the account of the passion on Palm Sunday and Good Friday, uh, as well as our own personal reading of the scriptures. Whatever helps you to get deeper into the mystery, hopefully will show you more of the Lord's love for you. The Lord's love is not an abstraction. It's a gift for you and for me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And next time, next, next Thursday, we have a holy hour at, at 6 o'clock. You're welcome. And then we'll pick up on the next session, March the 11th, uh, right here. So thanks for being here and thanks for joining in online.